Good morning, everybody. You guys awake? Good. Glad to hear it. Because if you're not, you will be. <laughs> um, um, I've been praying for you this week. I just want you to know, because I knew I was teaching Sunday, so I hope you've been praying for me too. Um, open your Bibles, if you would, to Acts chapter 21. By the way, if you need a Bible, pen, paper to write on, just hold your hand up and just hold it up high for a minute. Our ushers would be glad to provide one for you. I always encourage you to take notes. You know, I worked really hard on this message, and I want you to write every word that I say down, okay? Just kidding. Kind of. Acts chapter 21. <clears throat> As we start this morning, I want to throw out a question for you to ponder in your mind for a little bit, all right? When you hear the word sacrifice, what comes to your mind? Just think about it in your own mind for a minute. Sacrifice. You know, for some of us, maybe that conjures up an image of slaughtering an ox on an altar and burning the fat to God, Jehovah, from the Old Testament. Or maybe for some of us, when we think of sacrifice, we think about Abraham. Remember, he took his son and he was just about to sacrifice his son on the altar and God stopped him. Hopefully for some of us, when we think of sacrifice, we reflect on the young men and women who so bravely serve and protect our country. That's been on my heart and mind a lot lately. And maybe for some of us, you've never really even dealt with this notion of sacrifice, and the only thing that comes to your mind is a bunt down third base to move the guy from first to second. <laughs> sacrifice isn't a fun thing to think about. It's probably not something that we think about a lot, and yet, if you think on it for a minute, we all make sacrifices all the time in this life to get what we want. Let me give you a couple examples. How about getting a higher education? You practically have to sacrifice a limb nowadays to pay for that. Or getting married. In case you didn't know it, marriage takes sacrifice. You have to be willing to suddenly take somebody alongside and partner with them and share decisions and a house and all that stuff. Or even another level of sacrifice, let's talk about parenting. The sacrifices that we have to make to raise children. A lot of us sacrifice a lot of time, blood, sweat, and tears to have healthy bodies, good-looking bodies. And we're willing to sacrifice a lot, too, to to buy a home, have a nice car, go on a nice vacation somewhere. So we really do sacrifice, don't we? And we're willing to sacrifice for things that we want. But here's the question for today. Here's what we're going to wrestle with today. Are we willing to sacrifice for our relationship with Jesus Christ? Are we willing to make sacrifices in order to live a life that is pleasing to Him, that will be obedient to Him? Does He ask us to make sacrifices for Him? And if He does, what kind of sacrifices does the Lord require of us? And why should we really be willing to sacrifice for Him anyway? Well, our subject this morning is Paul. We're looking at the life of the Apostle Paul still. Paul's willingness to sacrifice to obey Jesus. He sets a really good example for us. And our objective, what I believe God wants to work and accomplish in our hearts, is that we'd reach the place where we would be willing to sacrifice in our relationship with Jesus. And before we jump into the text, you know, I believe... We're all here this morning for a purpose. God has brought you here. God has something to say to you today. And it's really not about him speaking as much as us listening. And so I want to invite you, let's pray together. And let's ask God to help us to hear and to listen to what he has to say. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for this opportunity to come today. Again, not only to worship you, but also to hear you speak to us things that we need to hear. And I just ask on behalf of all of us this morning, Lord, please help us to humble our hearts and open our, our minds and our hearts to you and help us to be willing to hear what you have to say to us today. Please give us the faith that we need to hear, to understand, to believe, and to respond. 
And I just pray this for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Um, just a quick context, and we've been going through the book of Acts, and for the last bunch of chapters, we've been focusing on the Apostle Paul. And right now, we've been kind of watching what's happening as he's on what we call his third missionary journey. He's traveling all around that part of the world, basically proclaiming the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ. And he's now on his way back to Jerusalem. And Last week we saw this, this tearful, wonderful parting, this farewell he had with the elders from the church at Ephesus. You remember they met on the beach and he gave them this wonderful speech and he was challenging them to make sure they were faithful to shepherd the church there and encouraging them to follow his example as he followed Christ. And then he had to, it says they kind of had to tear themselves away because uh, they all loved each other. And that's where we are now as we get to chapter 21. So let's just look at the first six verses of Acts chapter 21, verses 1 to 6. And the first thing we're going to see here is Paul's commitment to obey the Lord. And, and the principle that I want us to really dive into here is the thought that we should not let anyone or anything keep us from obeying what the Lord is calling us to do. All right? So let's look at verse 1. Now it came to pass that when we had departed from them and set sail, running a straight course, we came to Kos, the following day to Rhodes, and from there to Patera. And finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left, sailed to Syria, and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unload her cargo. And verse 4, And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. When we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went our way. And they all accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city. And we knelt down on the shore and prayed. And when we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship and they returned home. Let's just stop right there for this first thing. Again, we're looking at Paul's just radical commitment to do what he knows the Lord has called him to do. So Paul is returning now, as I mentioned, to Jerusalem. What he's doing is he's sailing down, and he's kind of stopping at all these different islands on the southern part of Asia Minor. You know, he's just jumping on board these ships, and he's kind of having to go where they want to go. And they go by this place called Kos. It's an island over there. And they get to Rhodes, another island, which, interestingly, for you history buffs, Rhodes had this amazing harbor. And at the entrance to this harbor was this almost 100-foot-tall bronze statue of the Greek sun god Apollo. It was called the Colossus of Rhodes. And for those of you who are familiar with history, that was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world was in this place. So they stopped there. I'm sure they checked out the, the thing and everything. And then they get on to this other city, Patera. And in Patera, Paul kind of makes a, a, a radical decision. He changes boats and now instead of just popping along island to island getting back home, he's going to get on a ship that's going to cut across a big chunk of the Mediterranean. It's a much more direct route to where he wants to go. He's going to get there more quickly, but it's also a little riskier, a little harder journey, a little more difficult for him. But it's because he wants to get back to Jerusalem. He knows that's where he's supposed to go. And so they, they, they sail over there, past the island of Cyprus, where Barnabas was from, by the way, and they land in a city in Phoenicia up north a little bit called Tyre. And it's so interesting, it says in verse 4 that they found disciples there. You know, this is about 20 years later from when the church was born. And it's so cool that Paul's stopping at these different places and he's coming across now fellow believers, people that have come to put their faith in Jesus Christ all over different parts of the world. The church has indeed been expanding and growing. And what's interesting is you remember Paul, before he got saved, he radically opposed Christianity. I mean, he went in and he pulled women and children and husbands out of their homes and threw them in prison just because they were part of this who new Christian sect as he looked at it. And so what happened was, because of his persecution, a lot of people fled Jerusalem. And some of the people came up here to Tyre. 
And so here, about 20 years later now, here we are, Paul, the great missionary, the one who's sacrificing so much of his life to serve the Lord, is coming back to a city where people are there who believe in Christ, who ran away from him 20 years earlier when he was in Jerusalem. I think that's kind of cool. You know, it just reminds us that the Lord can change people's hearts. I know sometimes it's hard to believe. Some of you right now are thinking of somebody that you're kind of doubting that. But let me just tell you, we see it over and over in the Scriptures. God changes people's hearts. He's in the business of doing that. That's what He does. I just want to encourage you, if maybe in your marriage or with a child, somebody significant in your life, and you look and just go, and I don't know if there's ever hope for that person. There always is. God can change people's hearts. He changed Paul, man. If he could change Paul, he can change anybody. Right? Remember what Jesus said, with God, nothing is impossible. Remember that. Remember that. So, Paul knows that God has called him to go to Jerusalem. If you look way back in chapter 19 and verse 21, it's recorded that it says, Paul purposed in the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. He believed that's what the Holy Spirit was calling him to do. In the chapter last week, in chapter 20, it says he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem because he wanted to get there in time for the Feast of Pentecost. So he's on a timeline. It's one of the reasons he chose this other ship and the harder journey. He wanted to make sure he got back in time. And in verse 23 of the previous chapter, chapter 20, he says, Now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem. Paul knew God is calling me to go back to Jerusalem. But we read in chapter 4, I mean in verse 4, some of the, the disciples there and some of the people he was with told him not to go. It says, in the Spirit. Through the Spirit, they told him not to go to Jerusalem. So, so what's the scoop? Who's right? Is Paul disobeying God by going to Jerusalem or are these people missing it? Well, here's the deal. Probably what happened is the Lord, through his Spirit, revealed to these disciples what was going to happen to Paul in Jerusalem. Maybe not in detail, but enough to let them know he was going to suffer, that he might have to make some great sacrifices if he got into Jerusalem. And so naturally, these people that have been traveling with Paul, these people who perhaps came to faith in Christ through Paul's ministry, they don't want him to go. They don't want these bad things to happen to him. They love him. They're thinking, Paul, if this happens to you, what's going to happen to the movement? You're, a, you're the man. You know, you're the great missionary. We don't want you to go up there and and be thrown in prison or maybe killed. And so they're begging him not to go up. But this does not dissuade Paul. That would be hard. Can you imagine if you were in that situation and all the people around you, those closest to you, are just pleading and begging you and telling you they've heard from God, you shouldn't go. But you know in your heart, no, this is what the Lord has called me to do. And so Paul is committed to obey the Lord regardless of what anyone said. That's amazing. This warning to Paul wasn't to prevent him from going. It was more God's grace of preparing him for what he was going to face when he got there. But they, they took it because of their concern for him and started trying to dissuade him from going there. Paul was not going to be deterred. And this is the principle that I want us to grasp this morning. We cannot let anyone or anything keep us from doing what we know the Lord Jesus is calling us to do. We have to make that decision. I mean, being a Christian means that Jesus is your Lord and that means that we obey Him. That's part of what it means to be a disciple we have surrendered our wills for His will. And we are now committed to doing things His way. Now, we understand that He loves us. He proved it on the cross, right? So we know that everything He asks of us is for our best interest. It's for our good. It's out of love for us. But the fact of the matter is, is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ means that we are committed to obeying Him no matter what. And I know for me, how do we do this? How do we know what he wants? Well, this is why he gave us his word. We cannot spend enough time in this book. God has revealed himself 
He's revealed who we are. He's revealed how we can have relationship with Him, and He's revealed how He wants us to live as His children, how He wants us to represent Him in this world. So we need to know this book, and good for you, you're here this morning, <laughs> but it's not enough just Sunday morning. We cannot spend too much time in this book. And then how else do we know? Well, it's the idea of abiding in Christ. We need to practice living every moment of every day, thinking about, praying to, consulting, considering Jesus in every situation, every decision, every circumstance, every relationship, every conversation. It's a matter of learning how to consider Him and seek Him in every time we have to make a choice. And I know, I mean, I know life gets so busy and we get so carried away with stuff, suddenly we find ourselves cruising along, making decisions, just living life, and we haven't even thought about the Lord. What happens to me a lot of times is suddenly, bam, some major thing will happen, and I'll make some unwise decision and crash and burn, and then suddenly I'm like, duh, I'm a child of God. I have a heavenly Father who knows everything and knows what's best. Maybe I should be consulting Him a little bit about this. I'm sure I'm not the only one who has experienced this. We need, to, we need to abide in Christ. And, and besides that, we need to know what His Word says. We need to abide in Jesus every moment. The third thing is we have to decide up front that we are committed to obeying Him. He is my Lord. He's not just my Savior who saved me from my sins. He's my Lord, my King, my God, my Creator. He's in charge. I now live in Him, He lives in me, and I'm committed to do what He asks me to do, no matter what. Now, if that sounds a little overwhelming to you, welcome to the club, but here's the good news. We don't have to do this on our own. The Bible tells us when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, God the Holy Spirit comes to live in us. And he is the one who reminds us and encourages us and directs us and empowers us to live lives of obedience. We could never do it on our own, you guys. If you're trying, I've, I've lived parts of my Christian life just trying to horsepower and, and be the good Christian guy only to crash and burn and get so discouraged. And I'm finally learning, and it's all a process, I'm learning it's more about surrendering to the Lord and through His Holy Spirit, letting Him live and work through me. That is the key. So I just ask you this morning, are you, are you living a life of obedience to the Lord? Is that even a, a priority for you? That you make sure every day when you wake up, God, I just want to live my life today to please you in every way? to represent you well, to obey you, to bring you honor and glory that you deserve? Or is there somebody or something in your life that's keeping you from doing that? If so, that's a problem. You've got to deal with that. That's what the Bible calls sin. And what do we do with our sin? We get to confess it and repent of it decide we're going to change directions and ask God to forgive us and heal us and help us and whatever we need. That's what we need to do with our sin. And so, just to summarize this first point, we need to, we need to understand what the Lord is calling us to do and we need to commit to obeying Him no matter what. Not letting anyone or anything deter us from that. And we see, that's what we see Paul doing here. But let's move on. Let's look at the next section here. And the next thing we see in the next six verses is Paul's warning that he is going to suffer for his obedience. And the principle for us right here and now today is that obeying Jesus requires sacrifice. Let's look at the text. Verse 7. And when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemais, greeted the brethren, and stayed with them one day. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. 
Now, this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. In verse 12, Now when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. So Paul gets this intense warning. He comes down to Caesarea now, which is a beautiful place. In fact, if you've been to, on the, the, the tour to Israel or if you're going, you get to go to this place. I've been there. It's this beautiful place by the sea. It was built by Herod the Great. And the pilot, when he was reigning there as governor, he lived there. So it's a nice place. But interesting, there's an interesting resident. Philip the Evangelist is mentioned, and we know him. Remember, way back in Acts chapter 6, the beginning of the church, there was a conflict, a controversy over the widows. And the, some of the, the Greek widows and the Gentile widows, the, the Gentiles felt like their widows weren't being taken care of and provided for. And there was this big division that started happening. And so the leaders of the church prayerfully chose seven men whom they said were full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And they were going to oversee this ministry. They were like the first deacons. And that's who Philip was. It says he was one of the seven. That's that reference there. He was one of those seven deacons. Philip's also the guy, when the church scattered because of the persecution, he went up to Samaria, where normally Jews would not go, and he preached the gospel. He told them about Jesus up there. And the Bible says God worked amazing miracles through Philip, and many people came to faith in Christ through him. And lastly, Philip's also the guy that was running along this road to Gaza and saw an Ethiopian eunuch in a chariot reading the Bible. And the guy said, how am I going to understand this? And Philip's like, hey, I can help you. That's the same Philip. We can see why he's called the evangelist. God used him in some amazing ways to proclaim the gospel. That's this guy. And apparently he has four daughters who aren't married yet who God has blessed with the gift of prophecy. And again, it's so interesting to think this guy Philip was in Jerusalem at the time that Paul, before he was saved, was persecuting the church and it's so badly that Philip was another one of those guys that took off running away from him. And now here we are 20 years later, Paul coming back from his third missionary journey and whose house is he stopping at? Philip's. They used to be enemies. And now they're on the same team. That's so cool to see. And this guy, Agabus, he's a prophet. He comes down from Jerusalem, down to Caesarea. And we've heard about Agabus before, back in Acts chapter 11. One time he came up from Jerusalem to a city called Antioch, and he made a big prophecy about this huge famine that was going to happen. And it came true. So this guy's legit. And now he's coming down to Caesarea, and I just want to point this out. If you, you see those words in verse 11, it says, Thus says the Holy Spirit. It's just a little reminder of something I think we forget sometimes. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's not just some power, some ethereal force, some impersonal entity. The Holy Spirit is, is one of the, the three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He has feelings. He thinks. He has a will, he makes decisions, and here we see that he speaks. This is the person who, when you put your faith in Jesus, he's the person who comes to live in you, the Holy Spirit. We see that he speaks. And Agabus does kind of like what some of the Old Testament prophets used to do. He kind of acts out his prophecy in a dramatic way. So it says he takes Paul's belt, and it was different than my little belt or yours. It's probably a long piece of either a cord or rope or maybe some kind of sash or something. And in front of everybody, he just ties his own hands and his feet up. And he says, this is what's going to happen. This is what the Jews are going to do to the person who owns this belt when he gets to Jerusalem. Well, that's encouraging. <laughs> Once again, Paul gets this powerful scary, dynamic warning about what's going to happen to him if he goes to Jerusalem. And you know, it wasn't a surprise to Paul. Paul already knew some bad things were going to happen. In verse 23 of Acts chapter 20, just the previous chapter, he says, the Holy Spirit testifies in every city saying that chains and tribulations 
await me. In other words, every place he's going, people are telling Paul, this is what's going to happen to you. You're going to suffer in Jerusalem. You're going to have to make some sacrifices in Jerusalem. Bad things are going to happen. It wasn't a surprise. But again, these people hear this, and because of their love for Paul, and because of their limited human understanding, they start pleading with Paul not to go. Don't let this happen, Paul. We need you. This can't be God's will for your life if you're going to have to suffer this much or make this kind of sacrifice. This is too much, Paul. You notice Agabus never said that God said not to go. He just told Paul what was going to happen when he went. And this leads us to this, this principle here that we need to embrace. If we choose to follow Jesus and live lives that are pleasing and obedient to him, we're going to have to make sacrifices. That's part of the deal. You know, Jesus never tried to hide this fact. Let me read a couple quotes from him. Luke 14, Jesus is speaking to the multitudes. He says, Whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. That's not mincing words, is it? If you're not willing to give up everything you have, then you can't be a follower of mine. And we know this one, Matthew 16, 24. Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, let him take up his cross and follow me. Deny yourself. And you know, this phrase, take up your cross, it doesn't have the same effect on us as it did back then. Back then, when they were crucifying people, they understood that meant you're going to be willing to die. And Jesus says, if you want to follow me, this is what you have to do. You have to be willing to make this kind of sacrifice. You know, so often today, Jesus is presented as this wonderful, loving God who died on the cross for our sins. And all you have to do is to believe in him and receive his sacrifice for you. And you can be born again, and your sins can be forgiven, and you can be reconciled to God, and you can have heaven. And that's true. All that I just said is absolutely true. But that's not the whole picture. The whole picture is that if you choose to believe in Jesus as your Savior, yes, salvation is a free gift, but it actually costs you everything because you are choosing now to sacrifice your own will and give your life to the Lord. And that means you're no longer living for yourself, for your pleasure, to do your will, for your goals, for your accomplishments, so you can look good. You're now living for Him, to do His purposes, to represent Him to the world, to fulfill His kingdom plans through you. And again, that's a good deal because what He wants for you and for me is what's best. He created us. He knows. But that's the whole picture. Following Jesus requires sacrifice. Sacrificing your plans, your priorities, your goals, your will. Did you know that? Did you know that being a disciple of Jesus required that kind of sacrifice? I think for me, and I think for most of us, we, we understand that in our heads cognitively, but when it starts to get fleshed out in our lives, in reality... When we reach that place where we have to make some significant decisions of obedience that require sacrifice, well, that's where the rubber meets the road. And it's good for us to realize up front, before we face those times, that's what we need to do. No matter what, no matter what, we're going to choose to obey no matter what the cost. Because we know that's what's best. This is why Jesus said, we should count the cost before we choose to follow him. And Paul understood this. Paul understood, and yet he was still willing to make the sacrifices and to endure the, endure the suffering. And that leads us to our third point here, the last two verses, which are my favorites here. Paul's willingness to sacrifice for Jesus. And the key thought for us is that the sacrifices we make 
in order to obey our Lord, will be rewarded. They're worth it. Let's look at these last two verses. Verse 13. And Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, The will of the Lord be done. That just really hits me. You know, all this begging and pleading by these people closest to him who loved him and who thought they had his best interests in mind only served to break his heart because he loved them and he hated to see them so upset, but nothing was going to come before his love and his commitment to obey his Lord. He says, you guys are just tearing me up here. I'm willing to do anything the Lord asked me to do. And if that means going to Jerusalem and being bound or even dying... I will do it. Man, does that, does that hit you? I mean, could you do that? I, th I think for me, I think, well, I'd like to think that I would, but I don't know. And then I think, well, I just trust that if God put me in a situation where he required me to make that kind of sacrifice, he's going to give me the grace, the faith that I need to do it. That's what I'm banking on. <laughs> That's how I sleep at night. But you got to ask the question, how could Paul do this? How was he so willing to make this kind of sacrifice to obey the Lord, the ultimate sacrifice? How was he willing to do it? I think there are three reasons. I mean, was he just some amazing guy with real strong will? Well, perhaps. I mean, we know he was really a radical kind of guy. Whatever he chose to do, he went at it 100%. We know he was brilliant, but it's much, much more than that. Let me give you three reasons that apply to you and me. How could Paul be willing to do this? Number one, Paul had had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Remember Acts chapter 9? So he's actually on the way to go and persecute more Christians, and he has this radical, personal encounter with Jesus, and he was never the same since. In fact, since that point, he had a personal relationship with Jesus. He knew who Jesus was. He understood what Jesus had done for him on the cross. What, what the God came in the flesh as a man and died on the cross for his sins. He understood that. And now he, he was committed to this relationship to serve Christ all of his life, to let Jesus be his life and to give Jesus his life. That's why he wrote in his second letter, second letter to the Corinthians, listen to this, 2 Corinthians 5.15, he's writing about Jesus to them. He says, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Paul was able to be willing to make this kind of sacrifice because he knew that Jesus had made that sacrifice for him. But that's not all. As I mentioned, point number two Paul was filled with, empowered by, and led by the Holy Spirit. All through here, the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit. He could never face this kind of suffering and sacrifice on his own, but Paul was walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, letting God lead his life, and that enabled him to have this kind of radical obedience. It's just like he wrote in his letter to Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, and we know this verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Not I can do all things because I have the will of iron and I can horsepower through anything. No, we can't. We cannot live the kind of radical, obedient lives we want to live in our own. But as Jesus lives in us through the Holy Spirit, we can we don't have to do it on our own. And the third thing, and the main point of this, is that Paul knew whatever sacrifices he made, however he suffered, there would be rewards. It would be worth it. And this is something for us to realize. The sacrifices that we make in order to live lives of obedience to Jesus will be rewarded. Rewarded. 
You know, in his letter to the Philippians in the third chapter, at one point Paul, like, writes down his resume of his birth, his education, all the things he'd learned, the great people he'd been with, all the great things he'd done. And you know what he says about it? He says, that's all a bunch of garbage compared to knowing Jesus Christ. He understood it. The the life, the forgiveness, the joy, the purpose, the hope, the promises for eternity that he had in Jesus made all that other stuff, all the stuff he was sacrificing seem like nothing compared to the rewards that he was getting in this life now and then in the life to come. You know, it's so hard for us, oh, it's so hard for me to live this life constantly thinking about the next. We get so consumed with this life. But the reality is, as Pastor Bruce talks about all the time, it's just just a drop in the bucket, this life, you guys. We're all looking at eternity. And we have the capability now to make choices of obedience to the Lord that will be rewarded both in this life now and even more so in the life to come. A lot of times Paul wrote about these crowns, crowns of righteousness, crowns that he was looking forward to. And he said everybody who followed Jesus and lived for his glory and looked forward to his return, everybody could get these crowns. And we don't know what they are exactly, but there's some kind of tangible reward for the choices of obedience that we make, the sacrifice that we make now for Jesus are going to be rewarded for eternity but it's, it's hard to grasp that sometimes, isn't it? It's just intangible. We have to believe it by faith. We have to trust what the Word of God says is true. I was talking to Deanna a lot about this. Poor woman wrote half this message. We were wrestling with this a lot the last couple of days. And um, so I give her credit for this next thought, but sacrifices that we make for the Lord are really investments. Think about that. The next time you face having to make a tough choice or to give something up or to lay your pride down or whatever the Lord asks you to do, it's an investment in eternity. It's an investment for the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus told stories about like the pearl of great price that this guy found and he went and he sold everything he had just to buy this one pearl or the treasure that was hidden in the field and the guy found it and he went and he sold everything that he had just to buy this field because this treasure, this pearl, this, the, the, the life that we have, the salvation that we get in Jesus is worth everything. It's worth sacrificing everything for. I think about, I think about the, the, the areas of my life where I've made the most sacrifice. You know, one would be just in my marriage. Not that my wife's made more sacrifices than me, trust, you, trust me, but, you know, it takes sacrifice. Uh, raising my children and, and even in my relationship with the Lord. Those, you know, sacrifices financially and with priorities and having to lay down my will and my pride and You know, but here's the deal. When I evaluate the things that are most precious in my life, the things that bring me the greatest joy now, guess what they are? My relationship with my wife, my children, and now I have grandkids. That's always a bonus. And my relationship with the Lord. The idea is what we sacrifice for and invest in those things are the most important and the most rewarding to us. It's in the same with our relationship with the Lord. When he asks us to make sacrifices for him, to obey him, for, to accomplish his purposes, it's going to be worth it. There will be rewards, the most rewarding parts of life. So obeying Jesus requires sacrifice. But the sacrifices that we're going to make will be rewarded and will be worth it. That's God's promise to us. So just kind of bringing this home now for us this morning. Are you living a life of obedience to your Lord Jesus Christ? Or is there someone or something 
that he's commanded you to do and you're not obeying him. Let me give you a couple of examples to chew on. Are you in a relationship right now that you know God doesn't want you to be in? You know it's not what's best for you. But you're being disobedient and not breaking it off? Or do you have some part of your life, maybe it's a TV show that you watch or kind of movies you go to, certain books you're reading, places that you're going, do you have something in your life and you know that's not what's best, you know that's not what God's wanting you to do, but you've been unwilling to cut it out of your life? Or maybe you're in the process of getting a divorce and you know, I mean, it's hard, it's sad, you've been miserable, but you know that God does not want you to give up on this marriage. He wants you to stay in it and give him a chance to work in you and work in your spouse and grow your faith and make you more like Jesus and be a a witness to those around you of God's grace and the fact that he can change people's lives and yet you've given up? Or maybe there's somebody in your life and you felt for a while now that God has wanted you to talk to them about Jesus. And because you're embarrassed or you don't feel equipped or you you don't want to be ashamed or you're afraid you haven't done that, Or maybe, maybe there's somebody in your life that you've been in conflict for a while. And you know God's been telling you, you need to talk to that person. You need to apologize. You need to humble yourself and and be reconciled. And yet you just have been unwilling to do that. And I could go on with the maybes. And you know what your maybe is. Do you have a maybe in your life? Something that you're holding back on really fully surrendering and obeying and doing what the Lord is asking you to do because you don't want to make that sacrifice, whatever that is. Well, if you do, that's something you need to confess to the Lord. That's sin. And just remember, as I mentioned earlier, God says if we'll come to him with our sin, he will more than willingly forgive us and cleanse us and change us. It all starts with a decision that we're going to be committed to obey him and do what he asks us to do no matter what. And we're willing to make the sacrifices to do it. You know, we make sacrifices, as I mentioned at the very beginning of of the morning, we make sacrifices for so many things in our lives. We need to be willing to make sacrifices and, and suffer and do what we need to do no matter what to obey our Lord the one who died on the cross for us. And I realize today there's enough folks in this room, not everybody in this room probably knows Jesus Christ personally as your Savior yet. And if you're here today and that's you, the first step you need to make, the first sacrifice you need to make, you need to lay down your will, lay down your life. You need to humble yourself and realize that you're a sinner. Welcome to the party. We're all sinners. We all are separated from God because of our sin. That's why, out of His grace, He sent Jesus, His Son, the Son of God, to come and die on the cross for your sin, to pay your penalty and mine. And He was buried and He rose from the dead just as the Bible said He would, as He said He would, to prove who He is. And He does make it available to all of us. Forgiveness, reconciliation, eternal life. But it begins by... Acknowledging that you're a sinner and asking God's forgiveness, repenting of your sin and putting your faith in Jesus instead of yourself and trying to be a good person. That's where your journey has to begin. And For the rest of us, we need to let the Holy Spirit show us those areas. And there are, they're there, even though we don't realize it, where we're not completely surrendered and obedient. And as he reveals those things to us, Man, we just, we're committed, we're going to do what you ask us to do, Lord, no matter what.
by your grace through the power of your Holy Spirit, we're going to obey you and make the sacrifices you call on us to make for your glory because we know in the end you're going to bless them and reward us for that. Let's pray. Lord, I just want to start off and thank you, Jesus, for what you did for us on the cross. We can never thank you enough for that. And you set the example for us, Lord, of the ultimate sacrifice, the God who sacrifices out of love for us. I thank you for the example of the Apostle Paul, his commitment to obey you no matter what the cost. And Lord, I just pray for us. Show us, Lord, where we are not living in obedience to you. And give us the strength, the motivation, the conviction through your spirit to make that right and to repent and to change. We want to live lives that are pleasing to you, that bring you glory, Lord. We want to live lives that represent you well to the world around us so that people could be drawn to you. We want to live lives that are worthy of the salvation, the grace, and the mercy that you've chosen to bless us with. And we just acknowledge we can't do that without you, Lord. And so we need you. And we love you. We're thankful to you, Lord. And we just ask that you would accomplish these things in us today for your glory. Amen. 